welcome <coughs> to this panel on the snow leopard, or as Mary Lyde calls it, the no leopard. <laughs> so, um, we're going to each make some comments and talk about some different things and maybe open it up for a little Q&A at the end. So I guess Peter is going to start us off. All right. Um, <clears throat> I don't have I don't have any prepared remarks to make about this to say about this, so I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I except anecd anecdotal thoughts. I read the Snow Leopard more than twenty years ago when I was um, trying to write my own first book, and uh, I found his I took his structure for my book. My book was a memoir, and so I liked what he did. He had a had a he has a, a present tense narrative around which he wove um, memories of his, what happened with his wife, of his wife dying, his, uh, some of his other life, and also his preoccupation with Zen Buddhism. And um, th that worked for me. And I've always said to people, um, and I, I just, you know, I was reading a bunch of travel books at the time, and so uh, I've always said to people, it helps if you have a model to work with. If you have an idea of a novel, or particularly of memoir, what, what is it that you've read that you think, oh, I, <laughs> not that I thought, I, oh, I could do the Snow Leopard, but I thought, um, I see how that works, and you're gonna talk about structure, but that worked for me. And it gave me, in the flailing around of the beginning of the writing, uh, you know, of writing what I hoped would be a book, that, that sort of showed me a path of how to do it. So I read it then, and I loved the book. Um, I was struck by what we're all struck by, which is uh, Matheson's writing, and um, and then of course his his Buddhism and his. I mean, it's a travel book and it's a spiritual book, and then it's a very personal writer's book. It's very much a writer's book, and I want to say um, uh, Matheson's quite disingenuous in it. I mean, he says things like, "Why am I here?" You know, I mean, <laughs> we know why George Schaller's here, and we know why the Sherpas are here, but why am I here? And I'm absolutely convinced that the reason Matheson was there was he, he knew, and as this film says, he, he knew he could get a really good book out of it. I don't think he was so as lost or as uncertain of his motives as <coughs> he claims. He's clearly a very ambitious man, and he uh, had then, you know, he, he made his mark in a number of areas of writing, and he was clearly on the lookout as a, as a professional, as an ambitious writer is, for something to what's his next big thing going to be? And it, as he says, you know, if he can't make something out of this, and he did, he made an incredibly wonderful book out of it all. Um, I, I've studied Buddhism too, uh, as many of us have, but I've never read such a, um, a cogent, distilled, elegant um, description of what Buddhism, particularly Zen Buddhism, is uh, as, as he does. So he's magnificent in cutting to the essence of a thing and getting beyond the, I mean, a lot of Buddhism is full of, um, you know, platitudinal writing and uh, metaphorical stuff. And Matheson makes it, I've got all these things like page number and I, want, I can't really go back to that, but his, his explications of Zen are terrific, very distilled, very simple, very clear. And so in this film, when it, somebody said, you know, many people have come to Buddhism, through Zen Buddhism, particularly through Peter Matheson, I can see why, because it's, I've read these other books and they're great, some, but they're, they're different. They're not necessarily by writers, they're by noted Buddhists or thinkers and stuff. And Matheson is first and foremost a writer. Um, I thought that this was, I thought that the, uh, the actual going to the, for, for, Matheson to see a snow leopard, and then, I mean, obviously for George Schaller, the, the, the reason to go was to see these sheep jumping around in the Himalayas. And uh, Matheson says, as I say, disingenuously, he wanted to see the snow leopard. But I think it's a really a very romantic book, a really, really romantic book. It positions the, the narrator, the author. So, so in this, it's kind of very much a confection. And I think we should realize that. It's a it didn't just sort of fall out of his trip. I'm sure he went with a with a big check from uh, 
Sean from the New Yorker, and he really knew he could get a book out. And he wrote this incredibly romantic book of a writer going off to the ends of the earth, and no one was as prepared as a writer to see what was there as Matheson <coughs> was. And it reminded me of The Razor's Edge, William Somerset Maugham's uh, The Razor's Edge, which has as its epigraph, the sharp edge of a razor is difficult to pass over, thus the wise say the path to salvation is hard, taken from the Upanishads. And um, I think he went about it just as in, in, a, in a very calculated way, and to write a, and delivered a really romantic uh, book, you know, in, in the, its excitement and stuff. Um, well, I, the thing that I know, 20 years ago when I read it, I, I, I really was knocked out by it, and I thought, Here is, here's a wonderful book, and it is, and I still think so. I was struck this time, though, by the writing, and the writing seems to me it's very much a performance, and by that I mean it's like um, if you see a really great uh, piece of acting by Laurence Olivier, some actors, the actor disappears and you just see the character, but if you see Laurence Olivier, you see the, the actor, he's sort of... He's, he's doing a fantastic job, and you're thinking, wow, what a fantastic piece of acting. But you don't actually necessarily, you, you do see the character. And I was struck time and time and time and time again in this book by a kind of not quite purple prose, but a very self-conscious writerly prose, which is his job. So, I mean, I'm not attacking him, but I, but I've, I've, I hadn't remembered that before. And I think the... He's really, he's masterful, and he assembles his stuff. And it did come out of his journal, but he then, you know, he went back to Long Island and he assembled this book out of his journals. And he assembled a very beautifully written book, but it's still very beautifully written. There's nothing wrong with that. But I mean, the egrets, the white egrets flying across a stormy sky, and it's very painterly and really excellent in that way. And the, the, um, the marriage, the juxtaposition of things like that with the spiritual or the, you know, the, the complementing of those things with the spiritual are, are really wonderful. But I, was, I just was struck again by, wow, what a really terrific exercise this, this masterful, ambitious professional writer has made out of this, as opposed to say perhaps, I, I haven't actually read Cheryl Strayed's Wild, but I think that is a book that has, you know, it's, it's, in, it's a contemporary, well-regarded book. I think that came out of a, um, the experience first, and then the book was assembled afterward through a thing. I just, I make this point just because I think, you know, I, I think it's really good to bear in mind as writers that you need ambition and you need to approach things in a very, um, you, it helps to approach things sometimes in a very premeditated way. <coughs> And not to forget that these really great writers who, and these really great books are actually, there are things that are fabricated, they're Fabergé eggs or whatever made by masters. And that that's what this is. Matheson's uh, prose here is very stately, I found. You, I, I loved words like, he uses words like improvident, which I, I love the word improvident. But I felt there was a stately kind of, um, you know, a really he sort of wound himself up to a platform of, of some kind of, stately authorial deliverance of a performance. And uh, so I'll let it go at that. that well, those, were my, those were some of my initial thoughts reading this book again 20 years later. I remain in incredible admiration <coughs> for it. And, um, and it rings true. Thank you. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit about the book's structure. And because I talk a lot about memoir and essays with nonfiction students, um, and I'm sitting next to someone who actually wrote a memoir and essays, that would be you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I want to kind of th think about this book as a memoir in essays, um, that if you took each passage that's in here, it would be a mini essay. And Baron and I were talking earlier about what you could do with a thousand words. And probably if you took each chapter, it would boil down to a thousand to fifteen hundred, maybe two thousand words. And that if you string them together, it makes this beautiful necklace that he's made. Um, and, and that achieves the goal of memoir, of remembering an event, and in particular this event of looking, looking for something that isn't found. 
But also the book belongs to a larger tradition of journey narrative, for lack of a better word, um, to which, of course, someone like something like Wild by Cheryl Strayed fits in to a certain extent. But I'm thinking of way back, like Basho's The Narrow Road to the North as a journey narrative. So to place it into a context that's a little bit richer than Cheryl Strayed, um, and to say that Peter Matheson belongs <coughs> then to a tradition that's much longer, older, um, and rich, and also multicultural for that matter. Um, there is this excursive structure that is part of this book that almost demands present tense, I think. And the use of present tense is kind of an interesting, um, it's an interesting element because I've, I've heard some fiction writers rail against the new tendency in fiction to write in present tense. Yet for me, in a, in a narrative like this, present tense seems to be the only tense to use to import a kind of immediacy to the event that it's actually describing. And kind of piggybacking off of what, what Peter said about um, his, Matheson's lostness, I think that's part of his, um, it's a narratorial device and it's really an artifice, it's part of his persona. We tend to think that it's Peter Matheson writing this book, but it's actually Peter Matheson creating a narrator who also adopts yes. a persona to tell this story. And the persona is one of this man, uh, well, the narrator is a man whose wife has died, whose son he's left behind, who has an interest in nature, but the persona is this seeker. And he's a confused lost seeker. So I don't know if you can see the difference between those two elements, but I like to talk a lot about persona and narrator. And for me, the difference is that the narrator, it's all nouns, you know? He's a father, he's a husband, he's a widower. Um, but, the, but the persona is something different. It's, he's lost, he's seeking, he's doing all these other things that are very active. So um, with that, there's also a great use of character, other characters, the scaffolding characters in this story. There's the other protagonist of George Schaller who balances Matheson's like kind of lost Zen Buddhist, you know, miraculous in nature character with this taciturn, and when you see him in the film, you think, wow, is that the guy that Matheson was describing? Because he seems so nice and human and warm, and he doesn't seem at all like this man that Matheson has described. And I would imagine that if we met um, Tuckton and Guy Alston and Jung Po, if we met all of those characters, we'd see something very different in them too. But what happens in particular with Tuckton is very interesting because he's planted as a device so that we keep coming back to him. He's this, he's like um, um, an echo that keeps resounding. And in fact, the word ringing keeps resounding in this book too. So we keep coming back to him as this, this point that we can land on and he grounds the other characters because he suggests there's some mystery about him that's there, and we're also very invested, I think, at least I was, in what is going to become of this character, especially when they haven't shown up for so long. So he really milks that suspense of them not showing up. It's one of those little narrative threads that goes through the whole book, even to the end where he can't find him, right? So it makes <coughs> sense, he doesn't, there, he, he sets out to see the snow leopard and doesn't see it, and then at the end tries to find <coughs> Tuckton and doesn't find him either. So I think that's kind of a, the fate of these characters propel us forward, if only to learn what becomes of them. So one of the things I like to harp on with people is what are the pivotal moments in a narrative, and what are the pivotal moments in the life of a narrator, and how does that help us define narrative and story? And one of, and, and I was struck by this one passage, and I won't go on much longer, but um, when we say that you need to write to discovery, um, especially in a nonfiction narrative, um, what that means is letting yourself go. And that's the other great wisdom in this book, of course, is letting go of your preconceived notions of things. But letting yourself go long enough so that you discover what Frost famously called what you didn't know you knew. Right? So if you can't get to that discovery moment, 
um, maybe you failed. And maybe <coughs> failure is a good thing and a teaching device, and I hope it is, because I think failure should be instructive. But on page, um, it, starts, it starts on actually page 242, the November, the, it's the November 15th um, section, and he's looking around and then he realizes that he's hoarding his last chocolate for the journey back across the mountains and I love this line, forever getting ready for life instead of living yeah. it each day. Um, and then he says later that the beauty of this place must be cheerfully abandoned like the wild rocks in the bright water of its streams. Frustration at the paltriness of words drives me to write. This is a little bit of what Peter was saying. But there's more of Shea in a single sheep hair in one withered sprig of everlasting than in all these notes. And in the margin I wrote, but is it? Right? <laughs> like I don't think. And then he says, to strive for permanence in what I think I have perceived is to miss the point. Um, and then he keeps going. And it's, it's very clear that this is one of those pivotal moments where he's realizing really why he was there, and it comes kind of late in the book, but it's his way of thinking that shifts. So he lets go of the leopard and seeing the leopard and of any kind of permanence, or at least he does on the page. And it's a really nice moment of discovery. Um, you know, you, you kind of, it, it's always wonderful when you think you can't make this shit up, right? <laughs> so the impending snow the idea of impending snow is the idea of impending doom, and that creates this other narrative tension so that, I don't know about all of you, but I was sitting here thinking, they better get out of there soon. He better go home. Like, what about Alex who's waiting for him? And, and, but, th but that's all a device to drive you forward in the story. You can't forget that that serves um, artifice. So it was very interesting, some of the things for in the film, <coughs> He, that line, he said, my characters don't step off the page, they step out of landscapes. And um, he also writes in here, he quotes Schaller twice, he repeats this, maybe it's better that there are some things we don't see. And I would add to that that I remember someone saying to me once, maybe there are some things that are better left unfinished, especially in writing. So when Peter says this is a writerly book, I think, some of those, there are things we're not seeing in the creation of this text as well. Um, and then there was a person speaking about Matheson's use of environment as character. And I kind of thought that that was an interesting point that we could all think about when we're writing that place can fun function as character very much. So if you think of Marilyn Robinson's book, Housekeeping, Fingerbone, Idaho is very much a character in that place. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to say is that, um, th this is just a general comment, it didn't occur to me until I watched that film that his book Wildlife in America came out in 1959, which is the year I was born. And so I had this terrible thought that in my own lifetime, the destruction of the environment has been so rampant, and then I see it exponentially increasing so that people who are in another generation <coughs> in this room can say the same thing, that in your own lifetime. So um, we've been talking a lot about Annie Dillard in our workshop and her charge to people that you should dedicate your life to something. If you're going to be a writer, you should also dedicate yourself to some cause of some sort. And I guess I feel like it is perfect that we were watching this film and reading this author. Um, and how I'll wrap up is by saying that it made me very sad to think that in my lifetime, somebody like Matheson came out with this book, and then Bill McKibben, you know, what, 30 years later or something, or less than 30 years later, came out with The End of Nature. And then recently I was at the Bronx Zoo and, and saw two snow leopards there. Oh, wow. And those snow leopards have a better chance of surviving at the zoo than they do in the wild. And so if there's ever a time to be a writer with a cause in the world, I mean, there have been causes for centuries and millennia, but I feel very strongly that now we're in that place where 
it's not hard to find that cause. So since we're just watching a film about an activist, and as I said to Baron, Len, you know, we were talking about Leonard Peltier, who is still in prison, by the way, and very ill. Um, you know, think about those things, that those are things around you that can motivate you in narrative very much. And it, it was really kind of a breath of fresh air to see that activist part of Matheson's um, personality brought forward <coughs> in that film that I think we sometimes miss. But I'll just stop there. Uh, but I, wanna, I want to um, say a little bit about what for me um, are um, some of the uh, spiritual dimensions of, um, of the Snow Leopard. I um, first came to the Snow Leopard, I read it uh, when it came out, so I, I was um, living in the woods in Maine off the grid. And um, it was a book that spoke to me enormously. And, um, you know, to just hearken to what, what um, Kim just said, I think, I think there are a number of, there are many levels of this book. And, and the basic level, I think, is, is how the earth lives. That seems to me almost the, the basic level of this book, which isn't something we think much about, because we take it for granted, basically. And I, I agree with Kim, I don't think the human race can go on taking that for granted, frankly, because I don't think there's going to be much of a human race if we do. So I think there's this, this uh, desire in Matheson, you saw it in the movie, to continually probe that, whatever you want to call it, question, issue, of, of how, how does the earth live? You know, what, what's happening, basically? And, the snow leopard is so extraordinary, and I'll, I'll talk more about this, because it's what? It's step by step, literally. People used to be pilgrims on this earth, and they walked step by step to wherever they were going. And we've pretty much lost that, the way we lost a lot of things. And that's, that's part of the genius, basically, of the snow leopard, is that just step by step, in which he encounters how the earth lives. And you feel that in the snow leopard, right? When you see the, he sees the birds, he sees all those rivers and streams that he sees. You feel the life of the earth, the snow that's going to come or won't come. Um, you feel how the earth lives. And, you know, it's animism. The earth is alive and you feel that. But then you also feel in the book how people live, too. There are all these people he keeps encountering. And they're all different kinds of people, even though to us we might think they're all the same. Village by village, he articulates how the people are different. And they have different approaches to living, really, in ways. And yet, you also feel the relentlessness he comments on time and time again. All the trees are going to be gone. The pressures are enormous in terms of the destruction um, of the environment. So, so that's in there. How how other people live in the Sherpas and their whole world. But then, obviously, where it really comes home is, how do I live? You know, who, who am I here amidst all this? And, and I very much agree. It's, 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 you know, it's a pilgrimage. It's a quest book, you know, to try to find something out about that. It's also, Peter used the word, which I think is a beautiful word, assemble. I think this is all about writing in the sense that we're all assemblers. We're always gathering. This book is, one, for me, one of the great books of gathering, basically. A lot of people would look at this and come up with something a lot more disparate than Peter Matheson came up with in terms of how he focused this book. So because he has that lens of his own life, the enormous sense of what? Loss that informs this book mm -hmm. in terms of what he, he has been through. So he's empty in a way. And it's not that this necessarily fills him, but it, it comes into him. I think he's open in a way because of that enormous loss. I mean, you see that, you look at that picture of his wife, it just, it breaks your heart, you know? She died young. And then there's, there's you know, there's a, there's another level, and I like to say in Emily Dickinson, where she goes cosmic, and that's how the universe lives, basically. I think that's part of the Snow Leopard, too, absolutely. That he, 
He goes to this place that's what, whatever you want to call it, the inexpressible, that which cannot be said, <coughs> what's in, you know, what's in the blade of grass, however you want to say it. And he's not afraid of that place. And I really deeply honor this book for that. And he alluded to, you know, going to Japan with, with Bernie Glassman. Don't say Bernard Glassman, <laughs> Bernie Glassman. And um, this, is, this is the book, uh, Zen uh, Night-Headed Dragon River, which is about his journey to Japan. But in the notes, he quotes, this is, this is what he says in a note. Having no real vocabulary for what science cannot define, we tend to dismiss all unexplainable experiences as, quotes, supernatural, that is, impossible. And the many who have had them, and dare say so, are jeeringly condemned to a halo of fatuity or downright mm -hmm. foolishness. Mostly these halos are deserved. And yet, and yet, as Rilke said in his letters to a young poet, and this is Rilke, that mankind has in this sense been cowardly, has done life endless harm. The experiences that are called visions, the whole so-called spirit world, death, all those things so closely akin to us have by daily <coughs> parrying been so crowded out of life that the senses <coughs> with which we could have grasped them are atrophied, to say nothing of God. And so I think Matheson, you know, he's going to that place, and so the upshot of all of these hows is what? How to live. And that, we saw that beautifully, I think, in the movie, that you know, one thing I love about him is, you know, how to say it's so profoundly, no offense to anyone, unprofessorial in the sense that this is about how we live on earth and it's important for every one of us in terms of how we do that. So literature is not something we just, quote, study. Literature is something we live with. Literature informs our existence. So that, that brings me to the, Matheson as the writer. And I think Matheson, and you see this again in the, in, in the, um, in the, um, in the movie, there's, there's how we live, which we know quite a bit about that, but then it's also how we might live. And I think that's a big part of the snow leopard. You know, just to read the snow leopard is basically to give us some sense of how we might live in terms of Obviously, just daily encounters with human beings, with the natural world, our own, our own use of language. I mean, it's all there in terms of how we might live. Do you guys want to jump in? Well, I, I, I was um, <laughs> to, to piggyback on what you're saying with what I was saying about his explication of Buddhism and how clear it is, but he also... I, I, you won't see a Buddhist doing this, but he um, has sort of joined rather wonderfully and neatly and availably um, the world of physics with spirituality by on page 61 he says, today most scientists would agree with the ancient Hindus that nothing exists or is destroyed, that things merely change shape or form, that matter is insubstantial in origin, a temporary aggregate of the pervasive energy that animates the electrons. So what he's saying there is that a anything can work. Any, any idea, any belief, any spiritual basis can fit into, can be accommodated by physics because we are all made of stars and star material and nothing, no matter has been created. And so, I mean, just a sort of like a reductive example would be people who say, well, there can be no such thing as incarnation, reincarnation because, you know, I mean, there, were, there used to be 50 people and now there are 8 billion. So, I mean, how did, how, how did we all come back again? But, um, but you can because, you know, all that matter is that the, all those 8 billion people are not made of new matter. They're not new matter, they're just a reassembled in, in, in the form of, in human form. And there's no reason, therefore, according to what Matheson is saying here, which I subscribe to, that we can't, that matter cannot be endlessly <coughs> reshaped. And that's what he's writing about here in the spiritual um, point, part of the book. 
Yes. I, I also was um, very struck the idea of, um, I, keep, I keep this quote in my head from Ursula K. Le Guin, of all people, um, and it's, well, she has an interesting story. We think of her as a science fiction writer, but the K in her, that middle K in her name is Krober. And Theodora Krober was the author of Ishii in Two Worlds, which is one of the most you know, tragic books you might ever want to read about one of the last <coughs> wild Indians in North America who was put on display in a museum um, by her father, who was a linguist. So when we say Ursula K. Le Guin, just think of her history and where she turned her vision toward. But she said, true voyages return. And I think she's alluding there very much to Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's journey, which is very much, this is how this book is structured, departure, initiation, return, right? Those are the, the, those are the three elements of this voyage, of any journey literature, I think that's what it is. Um, but what's interesting to me is I, I, I kind of bristle at the word journey um, until I read a book like this. And he uses it, and I say, that's OK. He's on a real journey. Um, and so maybe the idea of how to live, and how to be, and how to be a writer, and how to live a writerly life is not the journey you're taking with the writing, but the actual journey you're taking out in the world to see what the world is and to bring it back and put it on the page. And that is the hard part, I think. And this idea of assembling it, um, I, I, you know, if, if we think all those notes just magically turned into a book, <coughs> I don't think so. No, right? it, was a, it, was a, it was, as you, I think genius is the word. It was, a, it was a man who found a perfect marriage between his, his literary ambition, his abilities, and his sensitivity, his spirituality, and place, what he found. He put all those things together probably better in this book than in any other of his wonderful books, and sort of found a perfect way to encapsulate them all. But what you're saying, true, is I, I think what you're saying, and I wrote down here, the objects of the journey, the sheep, the snow leopards, they're MacGuffins. Right. And the journey is, is the whole point of the thing. Right. I, I, I was st my favorite line in this book is about, I'm very fascinated by the character of Tuckton, and my favorite line Clearly. is, um, no, I am, <laughs> because he's the, hmm, He's the counterpoint, I think, and the counterweight to Matheson's brooding sensibility. Mm -hmm. He's the uh, crazy wisdom, you know, the evil monk. But I love this line, there are no boundaries to this man, he loves us all. I mean, wow, that's a great epitaph, like I want that one, there are no boundaries, she loves us all, right? Um, it's kind of what I, you know, think is a really rewarding sentence to find in a book like this, that he's made that discovery, too, about another human being on the face of the earth who he will never see again. And that's the other piece, is journeying with people you may never see again. You know. At least not in that form. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, a couple more things I want to say before we turn it out to you and you know we talk some. I think in these elements that uh, that he's assembling, I think one element that that's that's <coughs> ideally crucial in writing, but it it doesn't happen every day. Very far from it is um, is enchantment. I th I think this is a this is an this book is about enchantment. Um, he goes to a place, maybe he suspects that's going to happen to him, and that's one reason he wants to go there. But he goes to this place where enchantment, which we, God knows what we associate with that word, but it's literal in this sense. I mean, he goes to this landscape that is so much vaster than any human being that it, that it puts him in that place in terms of literally... He's enchanted, and you feel that, I think, as you read the book, that it's something, it's something real, and that's why I read you that quote about the so-called supernatural, is uh, he experiences that, and it emanates from what? It emanates from the earth. It emanates from the, from the world of, of earth, earth and sky. Um, I want to read you a, a couple quotes, and, uh, and then we'll open it up. 
This is, um, this is from this book, Nine-Headed Dragon River, which is in many ways an account of, of history of Buddhism and Matheson's, you know, coming, into, coming to Buddhism. This is from a, 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 a Zen master teacher, Dogen, who um, is the originator of many of the koans that people are still trying to figure out to this day. When we view the four directions from a boat in the ocean, where no land is in sight, and this really applies to Matheson, it looks circular and nothing else. However, this ocean is neither round nor square, and its qualities are infinite in variety. It is like a palace. It is like a jewel. When a fish swims in the ocean, there is no limit to the water, no matter how far it swims. When a bird flies in the sky, there is no limit to the air no matter how far it flies. However, no fish or bird has ever left its element since the beginning. Again, I think that's a lot of what's going on in the snow leopard in terms of the no limit, but also that which, that which, is, that which is there. Um, this is about the writing part of, of, um, of Matheson. He's writing about Dogen in the 13th century. I think this is also Peter Matheson. Like all born writers, he wrote for the sheer exhilaration of the writing in a manner unmistakably fresh and poetic, reckless and profound. Though the risks he takes make the prose difficult, one is struck at once by an intense love of language a mastery of paradox and repetition, meticulous nuance and startling image, swept along by a strong lyric sensibility in a mighty effort to express the inexpressible, the universal or absolute, that is manifest in the simplest objects and events of everyday life. You're, you're right, sorry. I was what? going to say, you're right, he's, he's absolutely saying, this is me. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. And so, it, you know, as Matheson himself says in the book, it is the precise bite and feel and sound of every <coughs> step that fills me with life. And there, there's that great, um, from Rilke, um, that um, half line, which um, Denise Levertov used in a poem of hers, and the line is, each, each step and arrival. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's what he's doing in, in, the, in, the, in the snow leopard. Having no destination, I am never lost. Each step and arrival, then, then that follows. And that, of course, goes along with walking meditation in Buddhism, which is a form of meditation in, in, in Buddhism. Um, <coughs> And, you know, for me, if you said, what's the word from the snow leopard that I take from it when he hollers out at a number of times, now, yeah. you know, now, because that is, that's each, each step uh, and arrival. All there is. What? All there is. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, anything more you guys have to? I just want to say I mentioned Summer's at Mom's at Razor's Edge. I don't know if anyone's read it. He's sort of out of fashion. And, and, but I didn't say what it was about. It's about uh, an American who goes to the East and, and, and discovers, you know, is enlightened and comes back and tries to fit in with the world. And that was published in 1945, 40, 45. And I'm sure Matheson read it. But it's, that's why, I, and it's a very romantic book. It's a wonderful story and a, a fun Hollywood movie, the first, not the second. <laughs> But uh, that's sort of what made me think that this is a romantic book, too. It's the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a romance, you know, a, a journey. That's it. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a get-back book. It's that romance of, mm -hmm. of going back somehow, which you see over and over again in his books. Mm -hmm. There's this romance of trying to get back to our origins. I, you know? I play in the fields of the Lord very much. So, yeah, yeah. yeah on this earth, mm -hmm. basically, to, re, to, to feel that, to yeah. be with that, to live with that, yeah. yeah. Okay, what would you <laughs> folks like to say? 
Uh, I'd like to say something. Um, I didn't notice it uh, at first, but watching the documentary, uh, I felt uh, it was eerily similar in, in an unorthodox way to a, a Korean traditional uh, classic story. Uh, one of the few that really uh, remains to this day is called a, uh, uh, a direct translation is a cloud of nine, a dream of nine clouds. And in that, um, in the direct <coughs> opposite to what Peter Matheson did, a uh, Buddhist monk that is born into Buddhist, Buddhism, uh, a young monk, uh, is one that walks <coughs> around and he uh, sees nine nuns and he just feels a sudden desire and urge, not just of sexuality, but of adventure, uh, of um, uh, ordinary layman things. And then he goes to sleep and the next day he's reincarnated as, as a boy in the uh, just normal world and he has no recollection of his uh, memories. But then um, he just, and the story is about him going on uh, a life of adventure. Of, um, he becomes a warrior and um, he becomes a politician and in that uh, story he meets all these nine um, women and he has romance with all these nine women and after that um, before his death uh, it's been so long since I read it but um, around the time he dies he wakes up again the next morning and he meets the uh, nine nuns again and um, in that I, I think it, it think it's almost exactly the opposite of what happened with Peter Matheson's life and in some way uh, in the Snow Leopard. But I think it comes to the same conclusion, which to me uh, was the uh, nothingness of Nirvana. And that's almost the same uh, theme <coughs> in the story I just told you. And I just thought, I don't know if there's an American translation of it. And if, it, if there is, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> It's really beautiful because there, there isn't much. Right. Well, there, there is, a, you know, Jim, there is, you know, that nothingness. But at the same time, when you read The Snow Leopard, you certainly feel that in, and this relates to what you're talking about, Peter, everything really is, you know, there is being. The mountains are. Yeah, they are, hold on. Oh, <laughs> they, are, they, they are there. And there is a word. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, which is tatha, T-A-T-H-A, and it means suchness, okay? Just that which, and it, everything just as it is. And I think that's part of the enchantment of it. It's not, because it's, because, you know, our world is so much lived under the rubric of progress, which means we're always making one thing into another. That's what progress apparently is, you know? And he's, so he's, no. Nah. It's suchness that he, you know, again, this get back, this trying to encounter, you know. So certainly nothingness is sure, it's part of that dynamic, you know. But suchness matters too, and I because th every step an arrival, it's every step is a step on earth. Would you call suchness and tatha particularity? Yeah. That's a word that I use a lot <coughs> in my workshops is that, you know, everything needs to be a particular thing rather than just a generic thing. Yeah. Okay, let's take someone else. Sonia. Is that back, Sonia? So, um, um, I was really, I thought the book really broke open when the first time you hear about his wife's death. Right? I felt like that was where I the landscape and whatever I was interested, but uh, suddenly I see something that's also personally urgent. And I was struck as I was reading how spare he is with mention of her and his son. And so, you know, I'm just wondering what you all think of that, and I'm wondering if it's that same making me wait for it, but the restraint just really interested me, so. I, I actually think restraint, I mean, God, if we could all be a little more restrained, you know, <laughs> and because what he's, I mean, to say he's writing about loss would just be a terrible thing in a way. Um, because he isn't. He's writing about finding something really spectacular out of the experience. And I think the idea of suchness, that death goes there too. That it's all part of that puzzle that you, you can't appreciate, you can't appreciate what is there without <coughs> looking at what isn't there to a certain mm -hmm. extent. And, and the idea that he is restrained with it is very refreshing because I think I would have, um, I would have been a little. Ooh, I don't really want to read that. I want to read, and I want to read about the snow leopard, 
And what's interesting about that is he's restrained with that too because it's all the things you don't see about this animal yeah. that are important. We just see sign of it, you know, sign everywhere. Scrape and sign, scrape and sign, the animal that gets killed. Um, and that is the same kind of restraint so that it's like I was saying before, some things, um, but what Schaller says, maybe it's better that there are some things we don't see. You know, that may be a good mantra to have um, in writing, too, that maybe this is really a primer about how to approach a text on a certain level, that the particularity, the suchness, the things we don't see, the fine art of omission, all of that. Matheson's language also shifts tremendously when he talks, you know, from yeah. the, you know, not, I w you know, you know what I mean when I call it purple prose? It, yeah. it's, it's very careful sort of nature prose writing. And then when, when he goes into his, his own life, mm -hmm. he becomes, it's much plainer. Yeah. And then when he goes into spirituality, it's, it's sort of shorn of everything, but he's trying to express very, com well, simple ideas, but that, are, that can be complex simply. And so his writing shifts, so there's, you know, there are these three sort of areas in the book, and, and his writing is, is quite different in each place. Yes. Jenny, you had a... Yeah, I was just going to say, do you think that <coughs> they would have let him publish the book like this today? Don't you think they would have said, mm. why don't you frame it up with your wife's dad? And, sure. You know, like, let's make that the book. Possibly. I, I think also there's this was this was sort of a seminal work in its time, and I, and it and its you know its effect has been uh, now it, it's sort of the, the paradigm for many things that came afterwards. It really established a kind of you know self-revelatory travel book. Well, I mean there have always been those, but I do think today I think editors are very craven. They're market driven, and they they might have said there's a little bit much about Buddhism. I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. publishers are, everything shifts with, with uh, time. So I think they would have, they, they might have. But again, Peter Matheson even then had stature. They couldn't really mess with him. I, I think if James Agee's book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, if he wrote that today, I don't think it yeah, would ever absolutely. get published, period. Yeah. I, I don't think the world would be open to that. It had, had had a hard time then, though, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, yeah. it didn't come out yeah. until much later right. then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Going to go about five more minutes, so a couple more thoughts. Oh, um, you were speaking about particular, and um, I was so struck by his description of the girl pulling herself up the hill, because she is very particular, and mm -hmm. the way he describes her is very particular, without the you know, so I, I love that type of imagery, and that's very much a now moment. It's also very much a, sor a sort of a sacredness in, in, in something that you wouldn't necessarily think is sacred. But what he sees in her is very sacred. He, he calls it, I mean, he describes it as a teaching moment right. for him. So, yeah. so I love that throughout. And um, what you said about what you're not seeing, I, I think, and I could be so wrong, but there's a, um, a a saying about the, the the space of the bowl is actually a, it's like an art thing, but like, you know, there is an actual something in the space of the bowl. Does that make any sense? Sure. Yeah. More? Yeah, Bob. I, I was struck by how often his spiritual musings grew out of some great, uh, uh, almost, physical um, act, uh, physicality. <coughs> he's looking at page 140, where he's, his legs are tired and stiff, and he's worried about the narrow ledge. And then we go into this whole thing about the meaning of death, and why should he be afraid of falling when, when he's, he's accepted the idea of death. And then we get this whole euphoria around his broken in boots, and there's a whole, so in other words, you, you go from the particular to a, um, yeah, a, a kind of related set of thoughts, that, and it's always grounded in the physical, it felt like. Absolutely. I, I'm so glad you said that, because working from the detail, <laughs> from the ground up, yeah. right, we're so, we, we want so badly, because ideas happen here, and we want to go from here down, right. and impose metaphor, impose meaning, impose theme, impose this, but when we work from the ground up, that inductive way of thinking, um, and you work from detail, and you build up, 
it is so much more powerful. Right, and the stave and all these right. different things. That, you know. The stave, yeah. Yeah, people always say to me, you know, with poems, you know, where do poems come from? They come into your head? No, come up from the soles of your feet. Mm. That's where poems come from. From the viscera. Yeah. This is, uh, I guess, sort of a question. I guess, you know, reading like something like Siddhartha, where he starts off in this place, is maybe like enlightenment and comes full circle to find it again. Like, in reading that book, I come off the page and I feel a sense of like peace and calm. But at the end of this, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. I just simply sense that he's going to go through this cycle over and over mm -hmm. and over again. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because, or I don't know why, but because it's a Westerner? going into this and, and coming out of it versus, say, uh, you know, Siddhartha, which is you know, <coughs> based on, you know, Eastern tradition, and then returning to it. It's like, if you, I get a sense, like, maybe just because I'm a Westerner, he's a Westerner, I don't believe that he'll ever have peace or something. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, no, I hear you. I'm inclined to say Siddhartha is a work of fiction yeah. and this is a work of nonfiction. Yeah. But so this is a human being, you know, and so those, those cycles, are, are endless. I mean, people always say about Buddhist teachers, oh, they do this wrong, they do that wrong, you know, and the answer is we're human beings still. Well, you he's know? a seeker, and, you know, a seeker never seek, never finds. You just, <coughs> you just keep going. So he will always keep going. And, and as a writer, too, he was just always looking, looking. And, yeah. and Siddhartha is also a work of fiction by Westerner. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you, like, so you could maybe say that, uh, you know, it louds. Sue said that the true Tao cannot be spoken. Mm. So you could just leave it at that. On that note, I think <laughs> yes. we'll end the festivities. <laughs>